Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited for our speaker. She's one of our very own, Dr. Michelle Simisek, and she's been a full-time member with us here at UAGC for four years. So that's awesome. Prior to working at UAGC, Dr. Simisek spent 20 years working in public ed K-12 district in Colorado and Wisconsin. She has taught almost all primary grades and then became a literacy coach and reading specialist working with students between kinder and eighth grade. She also has an administrative license as a principal, the director of instruction, superintendent, but set those aside to work with adult learners here at UAGC. She's passionate about what she does. I enjoy her not only as a colleague, but as a friend. And Michelle, I'm super excited to hear about this today. It's gonna to be so beneficial for our students and all teachers out there. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tisha. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, so today we're going to be talking about positive discipline and how you can use this strategy to manage behaviors and get to what's important, which is your teaching. Um, so as Tisha said, I've been in the field for about 22 years. Most of my experience is K-12. I currently teach for UAGC full time and I live in Northern Illinois with my husband and two kids. Uh, one we just sent off to college and then the other one is a senior, so older end of the spectrum. Um, some of the ideas I'm gonna share with you today actually come from what I learned very long time ago from a brilliant mentor and one of my first administrators in Colorado. Um, so I'll refer to her a few times. Um, but really it's going to be about learning how to manage your classroom so that you can get to your teaching. I'm gonna stop um, my video so I can get to the presentation for you. Okay. Okay, so we'll begin with just a brief overview of what positive discipline is. So for those of us working with young children, we know that they all have good days and bad days, and we need to have some structures in place to encourage the behaviors that we desire in the learning environment. So with positive discipline, we want children to learn how to behave through guidance and modeling. In a positive discipline environment, you're not yelling, shaming, or doling out consequences. You're responding to the children, not reacting. So it's about establishing and maintaining limits with children. We want them to learn to be responsible, respectful, and resourceful. When it's all said and done, our goal as educators is for children to become contributing members of their communities, starting with the learning community that they are currently in. Positive discipline really does have the power to change lives, and it can be used in the family home as well as the classroom. Learning to work with our children to guide desired behaviors has a lot of long-term benefits. So how can we establish effective discipline? There's five important criteria. Um, Maurice Elias from Rutgers University did some research on middle and high school students on what helps children as they get older feel successful. And in the research, they found 28 categories that affect learning. But eight of the top 11 involve that social emotional learning, teacher interaction, classroom climate, and involvement with peers. So the message is that the classroom environment and the relationships, not only with their teachers, but also with their peers is extremely important. This is what's giving children a sense of belonging. If you go into a high school and ask the, the students if they feel like they have any control over what happens to them at school, they're likely to say no because they believe the teachers and administrators have all the control. However, if you ask the teachers, of course, they might say something different. But the point is, if you can get to the social emotional, you can then get to the academics. It needs to offer students a sense of connection. It needs to be respectful. We need to have a kind and firm environment at the same time. Is it short-term only or is it long-term? Because we wanna create habits and behaviors that are positive going forward, not just for today. And does it teach life skills that are important for the greater good? Do we invite children to discover what they are capable of themselves? Dr. Ilias says that you really need to have an umbrella over your schools 
goals and curriculum, which deals with that important social emotional piece. So you don't have anything that guides, so you have something that's guiding your work with students. He states that the social emotional learning and character development should guide the instruction. So that's really important when thinking about the classroom and even a school structure. So many of you have probably heard about PBIS or positive behavior intervention supports. Um, this is somewhat related. Um, if you have experience with that, it has changed over time, but in some models of that system, there was an encouragement of rewards. And in positive discipline, it's more looking at the intrinsic rewards. So that's the big difference. We want students to feel good about behaving and being part of the community. We don't just want to reward good behavior because that's not real life. So I really have seen that just making this the norm and the expectation and how one fits in with the community elicits the behaviors that we ultimately desire. So some people ask me, do, do I reward students? So I, I still do, but generally the rewards that we have in my classroom would be those that we work on together. We come up with ideas for something that the classroom can wants to see together and then they work on um, work towards those rewards together. Um, it's more of an experience or something that they would choose to do together. It's a great way to build community. And another key component of a positive discipline strategy is making sure that you set time aside at the beginning of the year just to create the classroom learning environment community. So when I worked for that administrator that I talked about earlier years ago, her philosophy was that we all should spend the first three weeks just setting up our classroom community. She insisted that other than reading books and engaging in some art, we should really be working on just the community building and fostering those relationships. We wanted to establish our routines and procedures and norms and help children learn how to work together inside the classroom and inside the school community. She really believed that once all of those routines and procedures were set, that it would be the better time to introduce curriculum. So that's how I started my career. Later, I moved to another state, but this is how I continued to operate because I really saw the benefits of having that community built firsthand. However, many of my colleagues would dive right into the curriculum because teachers feel a sense of pressure to get into the academics. They've got due dates, we've got standards, we need to get to a certain place in the, in the textbook by Christmas. I didn't do that. I really held off and spent the first couple of weeks still building that classroom community. And then I later got into the curriculum. What I saw over and over <clears throat> was that by Christmas break, I would actually get farther into the curriculum than my peers. So why was that? It truly was because my teaching was not constantly interrupted by continuously having to deal with behaviors. We had strong structures in place that allowed us to move more quickly once we did get to the curriculum. So the principles that I'm talking about in this presentation come from the book, Positive Discipline in the Classroom. It's by Jane Nelson. I'll have a link later in the presentation to her website. She also wrote a book called Positive Discipline, which is more geared towards parenting and looking to use these same techniques at home. So if you have little ones you're raising um, at home, that might be one that you'd like to look into. And the principles in her book come from Adlerian principles. And those are from Charles Adler, who was a psychiatrist in the late 1800s. He was based in Austria and he conducted a lot of research on the goals and the purposes of human behavior. Positive discipline is based on the theory that humans are social beings and our primary goal in life is that we all want to feel a sense of belonging. We are all looking for something. Our behavior is goal oriented and our primary goal is to feel like we belong. So that may be in a classroom, in a family, a group, scouts, a club, a sport. We need to feel that we belong somewhere. He also stated that we need to have a feeling of significance. I need to feel valued for what I can contribute to the group. I also need to have friends and peers who value me. <clears throat> Adler said that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. Kids are moving towards that sense of belonging and significance. 
And if they cannot find it, then they might act out inappropriately. They end up doing things to try to get noticed. I'm sure you're all thinking now about some kids you've seen in your classroom or you can remember from growing up. Think of the silly kid, the class clown, the one that yells or acts up or throws a tantrum just to get people to look at them. They then feel like they made a contribution. In reality, does that make them part of the group? No, and that usually will backfire over time, but it's an example. So we call those mistaken goals. We're gonna get into that a little bit later in the presentation, and I'll share um, a handout on that as well. So on this side, you, slide, you see a triangle of behaviors. And if you work for a school district or a center, you may have seen something like this before. It's very similar to the triangle used in RTI or PBIS that you'll often see. If you look at the very tip of the triangle, that's about three to 5% of our students. Those are the serious chronic behaviors. Um, that's in reality, such a small percentage. I'd like to start at the very bottom. At level one, at the very bottom, you have our very well-behaved students. They're generally following the rules. And then level two is where you see 85% of the students between level one and level two. In level two, you see some very low level misbehaviors, <clears throat> maybe some talking, a little bit of playing around, not listening. Then we look at level three, which is smaller yet, seven to 10% of students. And these students are the ones that kind of keep you up at night. Um, the ones who everyone likely knows. Um, and then that top number is the serious chronic problems, like I said. And those can get sent out of the room. Maybe it's a behavior referral daily or close to it. When we talk about interventions for different students, positive discipline will change what happens in the lowest two sections easily. It will then begin to affect level three. And over time with consistency, you will see it hit that top level of student. So the more you're consistent with this approach, the more your students will the more this will affect your students. You'll see better results if you get buy-in from your whole school or center, because of course these principles can be built on over time. So if you start to use it in your youngest classrooms, but by the time they move up a grade or two and they're still using it, of course, better results. This approach, if done with consistency, works really well for all students. And if a whole school takes this on, they generally say about three to five years for a school to turn a system into this positive discipline approach. When I taught earlier in my career, um, we used a positive discipline approach, although the term was not there. Under that leader, because it was so successful, it was because the whole school had adopted it and they adopted it the year before I joined. So I was able to see how it kind of looked after year one. And then I was there for a few years. So I got to see it after two and three years. Well, by three years, our students were so well behaved because it was just an ex expectation and the norm. And I have to tell you that I was in a really large district and there were 30 elementary schools. When our teachers needed substitutes, we didn't struggle to find them like a lot of other schools did. Subs loved coming to our building because they always said they knew what to expect. They didn't have to wander from classroom to classroom. They learned that the entire school um, kind of operated under the same approach. So some schools will change over time to this type of approach. Maybe they have something else in place currently, and then they'll begin to add some aspects of positive discipline. As they add in more and more of the principles, they might pull away some of what their current practices are and eventually only um, will rely on this versus their older models. So assertive discipline is probably what a lot of us started teaching or working with students under. And this was kind of the norm probably when you were growing up. Um, it was a structured systematic approach to assist teachers in running organized classrooms where the teacher was in charge. So for those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s, we remember this very well. Um, it was authoritarian in style and the naughty kids got their names written up on the chalkboard. There was likely a reward system, but only a few kids got to see those. So Lee and Marlene Cantor had developed this approach when they were doing work consulting with school districts. And this is what it originally looked like. But positive discipline is more focused on the belief that all students 
have something to offer and the reward lies in how the students feel about themselves for doing what is expected of them and to make the community run smoothly. In positive discipline, the community of learners works together to come up with the norms or rules and the acknowledgements. One of the most important things to have in place in a positive discipline environment is having jobs. There will be a couple of key components of this environment, but this is one of the most important things to do. You wanna make sure that you have enough jobs in your room so that everyone in the class could have a job. Work with your students to come up with some of them. Remember, we want to involve the students as much as possible in deciding important things for your classroom. For very young ages, you can guide that conversation, but they are still more than able to help you. This works on that sense of belonging and significance, and both of those are key in positive discipline. I know you might think that if you were in an early childhood classroom that students having independent jobs might not be possible because you might think the kids are too young, but I definitely would like to disagree with that statement. When I first moved to Wisconsin, I visited a Montessori classroom and it was a three and four year old classroom. And I went to the door and a young boy came up to greet me and he shook my hand and he said, hi, my name is Brady, welcome to our classroom. He was four. Think of the wonderful skills that he was building with this job. You can even have two students as the greeter. His job was to greet. There was another student whose job was to take care of the lights. There was another job, student whose job was to sharpen the pencils. There's jobs for everybody and you can change the job every couple of weeks. That way everyone has the opportunity to have different responsibilities. This way everyone has a way to contribute. You can change these as needed or multiple students can share jobs. Maybe not every day does every student have a job, but they should have regular jobs and feel invested in those. If you're teaching older students like high school, it might look a little bit different, but they still do want to be involved in the community. So find ways for them to do this. Another idea that some teachers will do is send home the child's job for the week. So for example, if the child's job was that light monitor and they're responsible for turning off the lights in the class as the class leaves the room, the teacher could send home a notice that states that that's the child's job at school and encourage the parents to have the child take on that same role at home for a week. This allows the child to see that connection between home and school and how they're valued in both communities. We all need to work together to take care of our classroom and our home. The next component of positive discipline is modeling. The importance of modeling comes from the research done on mirror neurons. If you're inclined to look up mirror neurons, I encourage you to do so. There's a lot of research out there on the heart of why modeling is so crucial when working with children. So years ago, researchers had wires attached to monkeys to monitor their brain waves. So they would monitor the brain waves of the monkey and then show them a banana. They could see the activity in their brains when the monkey saw the banana. And then when the monkey was able to eat the banana, of course, those brain waves lit up even more. One day, a researcher came in and ate a banana on his break, and the monkey's brain lit up just as it did when the monkey had his own banana. So this was kind of the start of the studying of what happens during that mirroring process. And eventually, similar studies have been done with humans, and there continues to be studies done on mirroring today. Think of when you hold your brand new baby in your arms and it coos and smiles. They mirror what you are doing with your face. The infant needs that, that connection to a caregiver. You don't just sit there with a stone cold face looking at a baby, right? You're making a face, you're smiling. The baby reacts to your faces. These are mirror neurons and they exist at birth. So you watch what others do for survival. This is a sub substantial way to learn from others. We don't just sit there. Um, if you look up the positive discipline book, there's an entire section of this um, and it's a great one to refer to. So along with the, the modeling, we want to be sure that children, whether at school or at home, we need to know that they are aware of us and our reactions. 
So conversations in children's presence need to represent important values, such as respect, empathy, active listening, and sincerity. If we model these values for our children, they'll learn from us and they will likely mirror or imitate our actions. Even on our darkest days, in the most challenging of scenarios, it is important that we all show respect to the children in our care. We need to show each child that we are listening to their concerns. This may not always mean that a child gets what he wants in the end, but he will have that sense that his feelings are respected and he'll make an effort as he gets older to hopefully listen to others, feel empathy, empathy for them and show them respect. It's also important that we all acknowledge our own mistakes. If an apology is in order, we model this process. This teaches kids that making a mistake is okay, that it happens to everyone, and the important thing is to acknowledge the mistake, apologize, and make things right if possible. We also need to teach our children to understand basic concepts, <clears throat> solve problems, and make mental connections each day. We do this by modeling our own thought processes and talking out those in front of the children. This helps kids to understand how adults reason out problems, take logical approaches to producing results, and also helps children develop their critical thinking and problem solving skills. So remember, kids model and mirror what they see in us, especially when they're very young. So those of you working with very young children, you especially have that opportunity to model all day long. And this is important because teachers are with young children more hours than their caregivers are during the week. So what we model is incredibly important. So we're gonna do a little brainstorm and I realize this is being recorded. So I'm just gonna have you kind of think of these things in your head. I want you to think about and I would normally have you type it in the chat. If you're actually here and um, live with us, you can do that. But what are some behaviors that are problematic, disruptive to your learning environment? What things interrupt you when you're teaching your students? So generally we're gonna say things like talking, children off task, throwing fits. Stephanie said outbursts a student bothering another student, older children um, on their phones, technology, not listening. All those things stand in the way of our teaching. Students hitting, of course, biting, um, bothering others. It's really difficult for us to teach when all of this is going on in the background. So here's a list that typically comes up with the problematic behaviors. And I just want you to keep these in mind. I think we all know what they are. If we've been around students, we can imagine um, the things that go wrong typically during the day. And now I want to fast forward to qualities and characteristics that you would like to see in your students if they came back to see you in 20 to 25 years. You all work with different ages. So try to forget about those challenges that you experience or the concerns that you have. Your students have come back to you and they're adults now. What are some of the qualities you would hope to see in those adults as they come back to you? Go ahead and throw some words in the chat. What are some things that you hope you'll see in your students 20 years from now? What do you think are the most important characteristics that we hope they're going to develop? Critical thinking, creativity, kindness, that one comes up a lot, kindness, problem solvers, um, having good manners, being responsible, respectful, morally grounded, team players, yes, having grit, Lisa. They're growing up with technology, so hopefully they have some communication skills outside of their technology. And we're hoping they're not prone to having outbursts. Yes, we're hoping that they learn to control their emotions, but that starts when they're young. And that really does start with what's being modeled for them every day. This is a picture of 
a Wordle that I made with some of the characteristics that we typically see and come up when I do these presentations. Um, if you've been teaching for as long as some of us have, I can tell you, I am blessed to have students that still get in contact with me on social media. And I've run into former students out on vacation when they see where I'm currently traveling, or maybe that I post that I'm somewhere and we get to get together for a quick hug and a catch up. And I truly could not be more proud of the humans that they are becoming. And I do believe that some of that comes back to how we raise them in the classrooms and that this positive discipline approach and the experiences that we gave really did serve them well years down the road. You can see the keywords that come up over and over on this slide. And in there, you'll see self-esteem. So I want you guys to just think about that word, self-esteem. It comes up a lot. You likely understand what it is, but do you know where it comes from? Self-esteem comes from being praised. Someone said at some point, you're good at that. But also it really does come from within. It comes from students figuring out that they can do something. It's how you feel about yourself when you know you can handle something. When we learn we can handle different situations and come out of those situations with success, this is a discovery within ourselves that gives us self-esteem. Self so we need to help our children have experiences that offer them the opportunity to accomplish something so that we can get them to have that feeling. That feeling is going to help them as they go through life. This is why jobs are so important. We, this is why we have to give children roles in the classroom so that they can learn that they are capable, that they can accomplish something. We have these children for seven to eight hours a day and chances are they are not going home to an environment that offers the same experiences to find success. So we need to use every moment they are with us to give them experiences in a safe environment to help them build that confidence within themselves. We need to keep in mind that end goal and how we get there. So teachers can use different times of the day for class meetings, but class meetings are another important component of positive discipline. You can do this, these at the time that works for you best. Some teachers do them first, oops, sorry. Some teachers do these first thing in the morning. Some do this right after lunch or story time and others will do it at the last part of the day before heading home. Class meetings are designed to be student generated and to focus on solutions. So students can put their concerns on an agenda and then everyone will brainstorm for solutions Doing this allows our students, even at a young age, to learn from the inside out from being involved in a process. I used to have a daily agenda for meetings, so I would set up the agenda on the easel before the students came in with a message to my class from me and a sign up form. Children would walk in and they could sign up for different things. They could sign up if they wanted to share a book or if something important had happened and they wanted to share. But the rule was they had to sign up before the meeting started. So this gave children an opportunity to think ahead. If there had been an issue earlier in the day or the day before or an argument or something had happened, they could sign up so that we could talk about it during the meeting. And the reason that we had to sign up though was to make sure that the meeting didn't get taken over by too many stories. So if a student forgot to sign up and then they remembered mid-meeting, they had something to share, I would just remind them that they could sign up to share the next day. That takes care of some of your kids that want to raise their hands and share everything under the sun that happened to them. Every day, generally a couple kids would sign up. If I noticed myself that something happened during the day or something concerned me or I saw um, something take place that might be a good learning opportunity or there were issues, we did speak about those during the meeting as well. And we used this time to work things out with the students. Now, I started this process when I taught first grade. That was the first grade that I taught, but then I moved down to a 4K, 5K classroom. 
I planned to continue this practice with my students, but my principal insisted that these children were just too young and could not handle this idea of a class meeting. I insisted they could, and I did prove him wrong. After those first three weeks where we spent all that time building our community, I had my young students trained to sit through a meeting. They needed quite a bit more support from me, of course, than a first or second grade classroom, but they eventually did run most of the meeting by themselves too. They were able to walk in and put their name on a clip and sign up to speak, share a book, share a story, and most of the problem solving scenarios came from me, but that's okay. They did still help me work through those problems together and find solutions. And remember those jobs we talked about? I always had a student meeting helper. It was one of the jobs. Sometimes I had two, two meeting helpers, especially in the younger grades. And after some time, those helpers could run that meeting with the class and I would just sit at the back and help when needed. I do have a small portion of a video that I wanna show you just for a couple of minutes so that you can see what a positive meeting would look like in action. It gives you an idea of how you might run it in your classroom. Now you're, I'm gonna start at kind of mid video um, and you're gonna see the students passing around a talking turtle. And so whoever's holding this turtle is who's got the floor at that time. But you'll also see the teacher broach the subject of an issue that took place and how she's gonna work with these students to solve the problem. So I'm gonna click on this. Just give me one second. and it's not coming up. Here we go. Nope, it's not gonna come up. We, we tested it earlier, but it didn't. It's not coming up this time. Okay, so we're gonna skip the video for now. I will put the link for the video though in the chat and you can check that out on your own. It's just, I was just gonna show you a couple of minutes, but basically there's this talking turtle the students pass it around and they share a compliment for another student or they just pass the turtle as it goes around the circle and then something had happened the day before and the teacher brings up the scenario and works with the young students to solve the problem so they brainstorm ideas and you can kind of see that take place in the video but again i'll put the chat i'll put the link for it in the chat so you can check that out on your own okay oops i advanced too fast Wrong way. Okay, so I have four squares up on the slide. When we look at behaviors in positive discipline, we're kind of looking at this balance between kindness and firmness. And we're gonna see some interesting things. So if you look at the lep upper left-hand corner, you see characteristics of a child who grows up with kindness, but without any firmness. So you can see that they tend to be like a selfish child, they have no boundaries, spoiled, entitled. They can also be bullies if that has been modeled at home. So you might call this type of parent teacher um, with too much kindness, but no, no firmness. We might say they're permissive or indulgent. Now look all the way at the opposite, at the bottom right-hand corner, and you see the polar opposite type. This is what you might call authoritarian style of parenting. And this is where we will see a lot of firmness, but no kindness. So kids who grow up in this type of home could be anxious, stifled, rigid, critical. They might be fearful, cautious. Sometimes they can also be bullies. And then if you see um, two parents, one from each of those two categories, you might think that's the perfect balance. But what kids discover is that they can work one parent against the other. And that is why you'll, you will often hear that aligned parenting works best. So parents really do need to find ways to align their parenting style for raising kids to avoid the kids playing that good cop, bad cop game. But what about kids that get neither kindness or firmness? So we're in the bottom left corner. That ends up looking like neglect because there is no direction. So positive discipline is where we're combining firmness with kindness. We're looking at connection before correction. We're showing respect for feelings and the needs of the child 
and we're taking into account those feelings, the connection is important, but the firmness is the correction. So correction shows respect for us and other classmates. We cannot let kids just walk all over us, of course. That's the correction piece. But that comes after the connection piece. We need to connect with our students first, understand them and their needs, show them we care, then we can correct them. Make sure that when you notice something going wrong with a child, you take a moment to try to understand the child first. They will be much more likely to listen to you if they feel seen and heard. Remember, there is always a reason for any action or behavior that a child initiates. There is stuff behind what every child does. If you think about a child who gets sent down to the principal's office, and instead of just yelling at the child, the principal says, you know what? I'm really surprised to see you here. This just really doesn't sound like something you would do. That's the principal trying to connect with the child. By saying those simple words, the child is probably already calming down and going to be able to listen to the correction that might be coming. So there is a book I've talked about before called Switch. It's by Heath and Heath. So if you're interested, um, you can look that up. But this is more about if you're interested in like organizational change. If you are maybe a director um, or an administrator and you're interested in adopting this model, um, kind of whole school or district, it's really a good one. But they use a metaphor in the book that I always love. And it's of an elephant and a rider. So there's a rider on the elephant and they're going along in the jungle on a path and they get to a fork in the path. There's a great big, and he's a great big well-trained elephant by the way. And the rider has worked with this elephant for years and years. So they are a good team, but they get to this fork in the road. They can go left or they can go right. Left is how they get where they need to go. That's where they need to be going, but to the right, there's a beautiful pond. There's a super pretty lady elephant over there and she is flirting with him. So where is the elephant going to go? He's going to go to the right. He's bigger and he's more powerful. So now think of that elephant as the emotion. It's the heart of the manner. It's the feeling over any situation. But the rider is the rational thought. So if someone comes in and tells me, the rational reason I should do something, I'm really not as likely to listen to them as I would if they came in and acknowledged where I'm coming from and my feelings about something. So we're much more likely to hear someone if we know we're being seen and heard by them. So the gist of the story is to talk to the elephant first. We need to show empathy, but we also need to find out where we need to be firm. Okay, so we're going to do just a little case study next, and I'm going to show you how to use this mistaken goals chart. So here's the scenario up on your screen. We're going to be talking about mistaken goals, and we want to solve the why behind the behavior. So we're talking to the elephant first. We need to get to the why or the root of the problems. So we have a four-year-old boy. He's, he cries loudly anytime he does not get his way. He's in your classroom. He doesn't like to take turns and he gets a soccer ball taken from him during a soccer game, et cetera. Anytime it's not in his control, he's crying and he's throwing a fit. So now up here, at the, we have the mistaken goals chart. And this is just the very top part of the chart, but I will put the link for the chart in the chat when I'm finished. Um, so we're looking at the very top. And if you look at the left side, it says the child's goal is undue attention. So this is all the way at the left and his mistaken belief. So if you go to the middle, it says the belief behind the child's behavior. I belong only when I'm being noticed or getting special service. I'm important only when I'm keeping you busy with me. So the coded message that helps us know that the child needs to feel encouraged. It's notice me, involve me, pay attention to me. So a teacher might want to solve this problem <clears throat> by waiting until the child is calm, for one thing. If he's throwing a fit, he's not going to hear you. So at this point, we could talk about what made him upset. Perhaps we give him a little time in, the, in a quiet down area 
and then 10 or 15 minutes later, let's talk about what made him upset. Acknowledge the child's feelings. What do you think might help you if you felt left out and frustrated and you wanted to cry? And with young children, often they're gonna come back with, I don't know, or they're gonna shrug their shoulders. And that answer's fine because then you can come back with some suggestions. So I might suggest, so next time you start feeling upset, do you think that perhaps you could take a few deep breaths or maybe you could count to 10? Do you think that might help? Now the child might nod because you've given some ideas. Now I might say, which of those do you think you could try? Because now I'm giving the child a choice, which is really important. Okay, so maybe the child picks taking breaths. So now I need to coach the child through the next episode when this might be happening. So we notice it happens at recess. I'm going to be outside at recess and I'm going to watch for this behavior. And when I see it start to happen, I'm going to try to get that child into my line of sight. And I'm going to remind him deep breaths. And I'll kind of model that with my body, breathing in and out to remind him quietly. So this is one example, but remember there is always, always, always a reason for a child's actions. Once we can get to the root of the reason of the action and coach them through, we will be connecting with that child and making long lasting change. So I'm gonna kind of wrap up with an overview of positive discipline. These are guidelines as you begin to think about setting up a classroom. Number one, it's really important to use encouragement to help feel that sense of belonging so that motivation for misbehaving will be eliminated. Celebrate each step in the direction of improvement rather than focusing on every little mistake. Number two, a great way to feel, help children feel encouraged is by simply spending time with them, special time. Many teachers notice a big shift in student behaviors when they spend just a couple minutes really connecting with each child and sharing what they both like to do for fun. So think about if there's a time during the morning where you can touch base with each of your students. It's also a great time to notice if a certain student might be off for the day, and that might be one that you need to keep an eye on. Next, we talked about those class meetings. You can use those to solve problems, by using cooperation and mutual respect. This is a key to creating a safe, respectful environment where children feel valued and develop self-discipline, responsibility, and problem-solving skills. These can be at the start or the end of the day, but find a set time each day where you can run these meetings and make it part of your everyday routine so that children can count on that and know they have an opportunity to work through their issues. Remember, children really do thrive on that routine and knowing that they have the chance to debrief helps them out. Next, we talked about meaningful jobs. In the name of expediency, many children and parents often, many, many parents often do things for their children that children could do for themselves. So remember that children need to feel a sense of belonging when they know they can make a real contribution. So make sure they have an opportunity to have that feeling of purpose in your classroom. Next comes decide together, work with your students. What jobs need to be done in this classroom? You wanna come up with these jobs with your students and involve them in as many things as possible so they have ownership. Have your students help you come up with the rules and the norms for your classroom. Put all the jobs on sticks and let students draw new jobs every week or two. Just keep them involved. Next comes take time for training. So make sure children understand what clean the library looks like and means to you. They need to know what it should look like when the job is done. We can't expect them just to know it. So do you remember earlier when I said, I spent three weeks at the beginning of the year building my classroom community and routines? This is when I would train children on how to participate in each area of the classroom and how they could clean up that area during a transition to move on. 
I would practice cleaning up the library. We would talk about it and review if the library looks good. We practiced this over and over until we knew the children would be able to do this independently with just reminders. We did this with every station, all procedures and routines repeatedly those first few weeks. Likely you'll need to revisit those after Christmas break or a long weekend as well. Number seven, we need to teach and model mutual respect. So one way is to be kind and firm. Kind to show respect, but firm to show respect for yourself and maintain those expectations. This can be difficult during conflict, but that's when you're gonna lean into the next guideline whenever possible. The next guideline is timing. So proper timing will improve your effectiveness tenfold. It does not work to deal with a problem in the heat of conflict. Emotions get in the way. Teach children about cooling off periods. You can allow the children a space to cool down and then come back together to deal with the problem with that mutual respect after you've cooled off. And teachers need a minute to cool off too, let's be honest. It's important that you take that time for yourself so that once your emotions are under control, you can have a respectful conversation with the student. It's not going to do any good for you to lose your temper and blow up to a student because then what are you modeling? Next, we wanna use positive timeouts. So let your children help you designate a pleasant area in the classroom with pillows, music, stuffed animals, maybe soft lighting. This will help the children to feel better knowing they have a place to cool off. And again, involve them in the design of this area. Remember, children do feel better. Children will do better when they feel better. So you can then ask your student, you know what, would you feel better if you could go take a few minutes in the cool off area? If it's a calming, pleasant area, they will absolutely choose it. Next, we need to just beware of punishment. We really need to get rid of the old idea that in order to make children do better, first we need to make them feel worse. Do you feel like doing better when you've just been humiliated? Probably not. Punishments work if you are only looking at stopping their behavior right in the moment. Sometimes we have to look if that works. Do we wanna just stop it in the moment or do we wanna stop it long-term? Next, we wanna teach our children that mistakes are wonderful opportunities to learn. We talked about this earlier with the modeling. If you make a mistake in your classroom, model how you work it through. This is such a great skill for our children to see us talking ourselves out of. We all make mistakes and we're all human, but every time we can model a respectful way to get out of that, our children are benefiting. We wanna focus on solutions over consequences. So many teachers and parents disguise punishments by calling it logical consequences. Get children involved in those meetings and coming up with the ideas that are relatable, respectful, reasonable, and helpful. We also wanna make sure that the message of love and respect always gets through. We want the message to be, I care about you. How can we work together to make sure we can solve this problem so that nobody gets hurt in the future? And finally, have fun. We need to bring joy into the classrooms and we want children to enjoy their time with us. We cannot guarantee that they go home to an enjoyable circumstance. Many of our children are living in chaos. So we wanna ensure that when they come to school, it's a safe and enjoyable environment where they feel respected. I'm sure everybody's aware of what's going on in the news with so much violence in the schools and they're really starting to profile this, where that is coming from. And often the profile fits a student did not feel listened to or respected in the classroom. Can you imagine the difference we can make if we all start working with our children early on to show that they have a safe place, that we hear them, that we see them and that they can come to us. So this approach has been around for quite some time and there's research on it over the years. They've uncovered characteristics of children who learn in a classroom that uses positive discipline. 
I want you to think about how closely these characteristics mirror that list that you came up with earlier of what you would love to see in your students 20 to 25 years down the road. I'm gonna list them. I put them in another world uh, because I love them. Um, but some of the things uncovered in the research are the characteristics of students who have positive discipline, honest, positive self-concept, responsibility, self-discipline, cooperative, open-mindedness, objective thinking, respect for self and others, compassion, acceptance of self, interest in learning, polite, courteous, honest, patient, empathetic, problem solving. It sounds pretty close to the list that you gave earlier. So the more you learn about positive discipline, the more you will see that it does truly align with the values most of us share as educators. So one of my favorite ways to learn new strategies is to number one, go and observe classrooms. I was lucky to be able to do this a lot in my career as a reading specialist. I enjoy going into others' classrooms and taking new and fresh ideas back to my own classroom. You will always learn something new by seeing another classroom in action always. So I highly recommend anytime you can get out and observe somebody else, it's a great way to learn. But my second way is by attending conferences or presentations such as this to learn a new idea or two. And the last way I love to learn is just talking and sharing with others. So to close out, I want everyone to just share one thing that they already do or have done with students in their care, which is already in line with the things we're talking about here for positive discipline, because I know all of you are doing some of these things. So what do you do or have you done in your classroom that might help others? So if you have a minute, go into your chat, um, type an idea. If not, think about some things that you know you're already doing, maybe jot down an idea that you heard in my presentation that you're gonna take forward with you as you continue to work with students. And we are done. So I will just kind of open up the chat if anybody has questions. Again, I know this is recorded. Um, you can always reach me through the email that's on the slide. Um, so I'm full time with UAGC. I'd be happy to answer any emails or questions that anybody has, but I hope that you learn some strategies that you might be able to do in the future with your students um, or in your learning center.